The Lord be with you. Please stand for the call to worship. Let, ourselves op let, let us open ourselves to God by laying down any burdens, worries, doubts, and uncertainties at the feet of Jesus. For attaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. To understand proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Let us worship God. As I rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my sight. As I wake, Satisfy and sustain as I hear voice of God lead me on, be my guide, be my guide above and below me. I rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ me all around. Sees me, 
Join me in a time of prayer and confession. Let's pray. Father God, you are worthy of worship. This morning we lift up our hearts. We praise you. We give you thanks. Lord, we come to you humbly in confession, recognizing how we have fallen short. Lord, we often pray your kingdom come and your will be done, but so often we place our own will and agenda above yours. We overlook those that are in need, those that are in pain, and that have wandered astray. Lord, forgive us for seeking our own comfort, for seeking convenience in our usual routines, rather than by faith, pressing into your leading, taking time to quiet our hearts and listen to what you are saying. God, forgive us for our selfishness, our apathy. Lord, we pray that this morning you would renew us. Pray that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, that we would be compelled to go after those that are hurting, to reach those. God, we pray that we would long to see your dominion, your rule, your love and graciousness flood this earth, flood our hearts, those that are in need. Would we be compelled to share your truth and love that our world, our communities, our neighbors would come to know you, to find healing, to find freedom, and ultimately find everlasting relationship with you? God, would you be glorified in our lives? Lead us and empower us, I pray this morning in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Good boy. 
they would see the Father's love. Test this out. <laughs> Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ. Worship together. I pray that this would find you in a, in a place of experiencing the real hospitality of Christ as we gather here. That we would uh, be a family that, that knows and experiences God's love together in this place. If you are newer with us today, a uh, special welcome to you. And you came on a good Sunday, if you're, if you're willing. We have what's called Look at Faith on the last Sunday of every month. And what that is is an opportunity to come and have just some informal conversation, to meet with a few people from our church. There will be some refreshments um, and just hear a little bit more about the life of the church in between our two worship services. So the fireside room is the first door on the left as you go out here uh, through the courtyard. I invite you to come even if you haven't um, signed up or responded to that invitation. We'd love to have you there uh, as a part of that, that experience. Uh, the bulletin that you received as you came in is, is filled with all kinds of, of information. I'll mention a few things, but there's other things there that would be, might be helpful for you to know, to serve, and to grow this, uh, in this week and in these weeks to come. Uh, and also this uh, blue friendship pad invites you, if you are in the center aisle, to, to take that and pass that along. That's really helpful for us, too, to, to know that you're here and ways that we can be prayerful with you. On the, on the back, in the narthex where you picked up uh, your bulletins, perhaps you saw one of these flyers for the Academy, Academy of the Arts. Um, and those will remain on one of the pillars out there in the center of the, the Welcome Center. Uh, feel free to grab one of these. A uh, great opportunity for children to participate in the arts for a couple different weeks this summer. All the information is on there and how to register we have some great teachers that are part of that, as well as our, our own Jacob and Mark, who will be uh, leading and guiding through that, that week. Uh, so it would be great for you to take a look at that opportunity. Uh, you probably noticed we have a few little signs of different life up here on the, uh, at the front, it, because Vacation Bible School is happening this week. It's not too late to, to, to register and, and uh, uh, Please let me know or, or someone know that uh, you'd like to be a part of that or your children to be a part of that up through sixth grade this week. Um, it would be a great opportunity, again, to, to just celebrate and to uh, uh, be, a, be a part of that, that great event throughout this week. Looking forward to that. Uh, I've, I'm told I can, I can assure you with 99% certainty that there will be someone in the Welcome Center if you are wanting to sign up for the fall retreat. I know that's that, who that is has shifted, but I believe you can find that, that information uh, from someone in the Welcome Center. If not, for sure next week uh, that will be available and will begin. So uh, look for someone to, to help with that, uh, that process and answer questions about that. I wanted to invite Dennis uh, to, to come forward and just uh, um, let you know about a follow-up opportunity to, to learn and grow. And, and class coming up. Thanks, Dennis. And good morning to everyone. I'm Dennis Monzingo, and uh, last winter we had a study uh, for three months in 1 Corinthians, and I was asked, well, what about 2 Corinthians? You're going to follow that up? So we're going to follow that up, uh, and it'll begin uh, in two weeks. So we'll study in July and August, Sunday mornings, 10.15 to 11, 11.15, 11 11.30. We'll see how it goes. And um, every Sunday, uh, and 
Uh, we'd love to have you all there. Um, Second Corinthians is very different from First Corinthians. Uh, <clears throat> in it, we find that the, the church and Paul are under attack from um, people who are presenting something that is a different gospel and therefore not the gospel at all. And it uh, allows Paul to speak uh, very uh, intimately and intensely about what the gospel is, about um, how he delivered it and what ministry is and things like that. So uh, I hope you'll come again and, and, and join us and share in the, uh, the study and the discussion together. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate that. I want to have an opportunity to pray for uh, uh, Emily Martin, who was a youth who uh, was a youth elder last year. Uh, she's now in between summer camp and getting ready to travel uh, back east to General Assembly as a young adult advisory delegate, um, the only YAD, as they call them, from our presbytery. Um, so we're honored that she's representing us, representing uh, our, our presbytery. And we wanted a chance to pray for her, even though, of course, she can't be here. Um, she, I've been told uh, via text message that she will be tuning in. Um, and uh, so we want to pray for her and offer her a blessing as she goes and, uh, and our thanks for representing us. So as we do often when we do a prayer of blessing, just invite you to put a, put a hand up in her direction wherever she is um, and, uh, and we'll offer her this, this uh, prayer of blessing. Um, and Emily, if you're watching and, and tuning in, know that you, you go with, with our blessing and with our thanks for, uh, for your heart for service in this way. Let's pray. God, we give you honor and praise for how you hold all things together, for the grace and mercy you give us each day. We thank you for how you've called one of our own to seek you and your purpose and to be used as your instrument of peace in the larger church. Today we give special thanks for calling Emily as a young adult advisory delegate to General Assembly. And as she travels back east with other delegates from our area, protect them and give them courage. You're calling them some, to something bigger this week to listen closely to you and to one another. To help restore the light of your church in the world, give Emily and all involved unity and direction through your spirit as they care for your world and your people. May she grow and be led to what is next through this experience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, finally, I'd like to invite Lucy to come forward. She just has a, a moment from the stewardship side of things. Uh, for us all today. It's Lucy. Good morning, Faith family. I'm Lucy Da Costello, and I'm serving currently as your elder to, of stewardship. And um, this morning, I just want to take an opportunity to give you an update. As you may be familiar, we do a, there's a campaign in October that guides um, your, uh, the church with your pledges. So when you make a pledge, it helps our church to know what, how we can plan our budget for the year. And it's just a tool. Um, so this morning, let's take a look first of all at what Christian stewardship is. And the definition is, a, it refers to a responsibility that we as Christians have in maintaining and using wisely the gifts that God has given us. The past weeks, few weeks from our pastors, we've been learning more about becoming apprentices of Christ. You and I are called to live our lives as living sacrifices in all that we do and with all that we have. First of all, thank you to each of you who, have, who faithfully give, who faithfully pledge, and your tithes and your offerings. Your support for the ongoing ministry of Faith Presbyterian Church makes it possible for us to serve our church, but also our community. Perhaps you've considered making a pledge, or maybe you're newer to faith and you'd like to begin or know more about it. We would like to offer you this mid-year opportunity to make a pledge to Faith Church. You'll find the pledge cards in the pew in front of you, or if you go online to the 
church website and you click on the online giving tab on the main page, you'll find a link there where you could make a pledge for the balance of this year. And the stewardship is for children too. Um, we are excited to offer a between services session for our children and their parents. And it's, this is a smart saver bank. It has three sections, spend, give, and save. And it's part of the Dave Ramsey program, if you're familiar with that. So we're going to be just doing this on July 17th. It'll be a workshop between services. So after this service and uh, just for a few minutes, and um, our very own Barraquette Chapman is grew up using a bank that looks a little different than this, but it's the same type of bank. And she's going to be presenting to our amazing children how she used her bank and what that taught her and what she has learned from it. So uh, there's also more information for parents um, that you can access online with, with this bank. Uh, with this program. If you would like to attend, please get in contact with Jacob and you'll be getting more information about that. So again, that's on July 17th. Now, God's word tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and he delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. Thank you for considering both of these opportunities, and if you have any questions or would like to talk further about it, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Some great opportunities there. Uh, I'd love to invite the children that are here to come and join me for a few minutes right up here. All right, you know what? I know you're used to sitting in the front pew here, but I, I, I'd love it if you could come right down here and just sit right here in the water, right at the bottom of this dock here. Just, just plop right down. I'm, I'm gonna sit on the edge of the dock. I don't wanna get my shoes wet, so. You, it's not water? You don't think, it's plastic? Well, you gotta use your imagination just a little bit uh, today. So go, go ahead and have a seat right here and find a dry spot, a rock to sit on, something like that. And go ahead and, go ahead and plop down just for a couple minutes. Does anybody have any guesses why we have this dock sitting here in the middle of the, of the church? VBS. Yeah. VBS, Vacation Bible School. Are any of you planning to come to Vacation Bible School this week? Uh, yeah, this week. This week? Good. I hope it's because that's when it is. Yep, it starts tomorrow. We have a little beach shack. And these are just a little taste of what is to come. Um, and as Maggie said, it's just plastic. But we're using our imagination, which you kind of have to use sometimes when Jesus tells stories. But, the, but the, good, the good thing is when Jesus tells stories that are called parables, it's, it sort of gives us this opportunity for us to, uh, to use our imaginations um, to really hear what Jesus is telling us about what, what he's telling us, what, what heaven's like or what life on earth can be when we, when we love Jesus and we know that Jesus loves us. Um, I've always wanted to, to preach on a dock. You think, I, you think I should bring my, the pulpit right out here and, and, and preach or later? What could, go, what could go wrong, right? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, it's, it's, I, think that's, I think that's wise. So with the wisdom of Maggie, I'm not going to preach on the dock, but it's kind of fun just sitting here. It's, it's, it's nice when we get to hear in a different sort of a different place what life is like to follow Jesus in our everyday lives, wherever we are, and not just in church, right? So my friend Dennis is going to read uh, a parable. We're starting this series about these stories that Jesus tells about what the kingdom of heaven might be like. And this morning we're going to hear the first one about some sheep. So, Dennis. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to follow along in your Bible uh, or with one of the pew Bibles, or it's also printed in the bulletin. Listen carefully now to God's word. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Leave his whole flock to go look for just one? You think a shepherd would do that? It seems irresponsible, doesn't it? Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes God's love is, is just a little bit crazy like that. And we don't quite understand how God could love us that much. But that's what we're going to look at today a little bit. And I'd love for you to talk with, with your parents uh, about, those, about those questions. Um, there's, they're in your bulletin, and, this, and they, they are, do you think a shepherd would really leave his whole flock? And how is this like God? How is God like that? Um, this morning, as, uh, as our prayer... I want to have a, a chance to pray for all those that are involved in Vacation Bible School. The leaders, those of you that are participating. So we're going to offer a little prayer of blessing for them as we, um, as we think about this parable further too. Um, as we think about this opportunity to be like the shepherd and, and, um, and learning about God's love all week. So if you're helping with Vacation Bible School, I'd love for you to stand up. If you've been a part of decorating, if you've been a part of any kind of planning, if you could stand up. Those of you kids who are participating... Um, you, can st- you guys can stand up with us here, and we're going to we'll say a little prayer for those that are a part of this. So let's, let's pray together. Loving God, you have entrusted us with this message of your power, your grace, and your love. We ask for your guidance that we may be teachers and learners together. Believing that you are in our midst, we set apart those who would serve in our vacation Bible school. May they, may we serve you in nurturing and the spiritual growth of all who are entrusted in their care. Bless each one of us as we gather here this week. Enable us to be channels of your grace. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Thanks, you guys. You can follow. Who are we following? It's It's Jennifer and Alice. You guys are going to have a great time. Let's pray together one more time. God, we, th- we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to hear your word, and we, we pray that all that we hear, all that we speak, that we think that it would be your spirit that allows it, that we would be able to, um, to know you deeper uh, because of our time here together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, someone was to ask me about my favorite preaching opportunity uh, it was one in which only two people from this church were, were with me. In a little church in Guatemala on a short immersion trip with Lori Sprinkle, and her husband Ron stayed up almost all night uh, preparing the translation so he could be my translator the next day, uh, which made the sermon about twice as long. I won't do that to you today. But during that message, I, I told a parable of sorts about the day I proposed to my wife. Um, There is a place, and literally that's the slogan, there is a place, um, in central Oregon where Wendy's family and my family have been going on vacation together since we were in about fourth grade. And so so every year uh, during our dating years, when that was later than fourth grade, uh, quite a bit, in our college years, uh, we would make plans to rent a canoe and uh, and go out on this pond with the central Oregon mountains all around as was our custom. Only this particular time, I had a ring with me. And I was planning to have the ring in my pocket and wait until the perfect, quiet moment to pop the question. But the night before, I started having 
questions. When you propose, you want to be closer than the eight-foot span that you're sitting in in a canoe. And, but I'm, and I envision being on one knee, so how is, this, how is this all exactly going to work? And anyway, how do you start, even start this conversation of how you propose uh, such a big question? So I decided to write her a poem. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole poem. That's just for she and I, and if you want to ask her afterwards, maybe she'll tell you. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to share you just, with, just the way it started, which was all about these questions that I, was, uh, that I was having. It began like this. What can I say? What can I do? Can I kneel inside a canoe? I didn't say I'm a great poet, but it worked. And so there was more to, that, to it than that, but, but these are the questions that I, that I brought into this Guatemalan church at a time of cultural and, and political turmoil with so much that is going on around them, much of which still exists today. And to watch their pastor reflect on afterwards in Spanish that was far too fast for me, what it must be like to, to scoot forward and to propose in, an, in this unstable situation and he was doing this with his hands, laughing with his congregation. And I couldn't understand what he was saying, but I, but I could. I knew uh, that, that in this rare moment of preaching that they got it. It was a parable that made sense at that moment. There was encouragement to be found in Scripture that there really are things that we can say. There really are things that we can do. And we really can kneel and trust in a God who is good and faithful in the midst of chaos. In the end, by the way, the boat did not tip, the ring did not go in the water, and Wendy eventually said yes. <laughs> well, for this summer season, we're, we're uh, beginning a series on the kingdom of heaven parables, as Jesus tells them. Stories Jesus tells to give a sense of, of what, it, what this different kind of kingdom looks like. And many of them begin with, the kingdom of heaven is like. Um, but some, like the parable that we have today, of the lost sheep, do not. When we hear the word kingdom, we tend to think about geographical locations ruled by various political groups or people here on earth. And when we hear the word heaven, we tend to think of that place that we will eventually go after our time on earth here is finished. In both cases, Jesus brings stories about familiar things, in this case sheep and shepherds, to, to help us to rethink or to rehear the way we have approached both kingdoms as we think of them now and, and heaven as a place not just in the future but, but where we live here in relationship to God. And so that the kingdom of heaven is not something we discover someday, but something we enter into right now. This is what Jesus is trying to remind us about. The kingdom of heaven does, does not come only after we die sometime in the future. The kingdom of heaven does not come only when the right political uh, pieces and leaders are in place and make the right decisions for that kingdom. No, the kingdom of heaven is now a different reality altogether, peace-filled because of the one who rules that kingdom uh, with so many unexplainable and painful realities in which we live. The kingdom of heaven gives us different things to say, different things to do, and it is the reason that we can, in fact, kneel inside of a canoe. One overarching comment I'd, I'd like to make about a theme that seems to run through all of these parables, or many of them, that we will study, and it's a theme of joy. My little parable of the canoe is, is a memory of joy for me, of course, but in a much deeper and wider way, the kingdom of heaven is one in which people find joy, unrestrained joy, the, the let's throw a party kind of joy and share it with everyone the treasure hidden in a field, the, the, the pearl that is found, and the lost coin, the prodigal son, all of them end with this, this great celebration. 
This morning, our, our very first parable in this series is no exception. Jesus says the man called everyone together to celebrate, and there would be so much joy over just one that is found. And when Jesus quotes this man, he's also saying this to the people literally at the table where he is sitting. Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. It's interesting that sheep in English could be plural or singular. This very first parable is about who we think might be invited into this different kingdom of heaven that Jesus is portraying for us. And it's about joy and not regret that they get to be at that table with us. And that can be, if we're honest, a fine line to walk, to realize and to welcome in those who maybe we previously had not thought to be invited at that table. So right away, in just a few simple sentences, Jesus' story serves as a reassurance to many that are seated there, but also as a warning and a challenge to others this might, this might be more accurately called the parable of the found sheep because of that joy rather than sadness that is the characteristic of the kingdom of heaven. Like many of the parables and stories of Jesus' life, more than one of the gospel writers uh, often recorded them. And in this case, the context and details of the story are different enough that scholars debate whether, they, that whether Matthew and Luke are really telling the same story. We find out also in Matthew 18, his version, which is much shorter and, and, and reads like this. Listen here for the differences. Matthew records, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than the other ninety-nine that never went astray. Well, first you'll notice that I left out several verses between one and twelve of that chapter. Matthew there is including several comments about how we are to approach children, especially in God's kingdom. And especially children that we might not expect to have the, the, the respect and the, the understanding before God. Th- these are the ones that, that, that deserve our greatest respect. And so the audience here is, is, is Jesus' disciples, which is different than what we have in Luke. And it's a conversation about how to approach ministry more intergenerationally with the children around us. Which, of course, as a pastor to youth and families, I'm thrilled about this. But the audience in our story today in Luke is something quite different. Two different groups on opposite sides of a table where they're sharing a meal. And the story serves two very different purposes, which of course I did with the parable of the canoe even just this morning. So why not? Why couldn't Jesus use the same story as a teaching in different contexts? Even the story in Luke told around a table uh, of different people had these different purposes in that same place. Now, it's not really that important, I think, and many would agree, to try and figure out who wrote their version of the story first or which one was embellishing the story just a little bit more to make their point. But rather, let's take a look this morning at the truth of this good news of the gospel that is made so evident here in Luke. I tend to like this version of the story because of this, the setting and the audience. It stirs my imagination to try and picture the reactions, the reactions or the sideways glances of the various groups around the table. And rather than making excuses or trying to explain himself, Jesus answers this question with this story that the, that the Pharisees and the scribes are muttering to themselves. And Jesus overhears, why does this fellow eat with sinners and tax collectors and welcomes them? And at the very same time he tells this story, it answers this unstated question that we don't hear, but we feel by these, these tax collectors and those that are called sinners. Why is this fellow eating with me and welcoming me? 
Well, isn't it interesting that we don't really hear about the reaction to this story by, by the other sheep? Now, they apparently just keep grazing on the hill and, uh, and huddling together without any knowledge that the shepherd has gone away to find this lost sheep. Were they, were they angry? Were they afraid? Were they, were they humbled or, or reassured? Could they possibly have had a moment where they were inspired or encouraged? We're really left to decide for ourselves what the other 98 were experiencing. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 talks about the body of Christ. Paul says here, if one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one is honored, all rejoice with it. In the message version, which is also on your front cover today, it reads, if one part hurts, every part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. Would the Pharisees and the scribes be able to look past their tradition to see the hurt of the others? Would they notice that, that they are the 98 and that Jesus came for those humbled by the world and living in the darker corners and begin to let go of, of some of this overconfidence of faith that they have? Jesus' whole mission that he introduces again in this parable is to have people on both sides of the table look across at each other and realize that whatever they originally thought, they all belong there. And that only Jesus, with this new kind of kingdom, this kingdom of heaven that he introduces, can make that possible. I had a conversation this week with our new interns, Kat and LSA, um, and it stirred up for, for me some thoughts on this, uh, hopefully for all three of us. And LSA was remembering Jesus' mission statement when he proclaims, which we find in Luke 4 as he quotes Isaiah, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to, to preach, to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, based on this and the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, LSA was left wondering, what about the rich? How do they stand a chance? It does seem like the outcasts have special standing and special favor in the eyes of the Lord, to whom God draws near. God walks away from the 98, from the rich and the well taken care of, uh, to fill a place in someone else's life that has no other resource, no other hope. And Kat was remembering, uh, as a part of the same conversation, uh, that, uh, and being encouraged by this thought, that every one of us has this place in our lives that only God can fill. And this isn't reserved just for the poor and the outcasts. They just don't have so many layers of stuff in their lives to shed in order to be able to see it. It's as if Jesus is asking the 98, how are you also, how are you also like these that I've been searching for? Okay, let me clear up some math here. If some of you in this room are likely to be a little too right-brained and it's driving you crazy that I keep saying 98 over and over. You assume I'm making a mistake. You, you, you haven't maybe heard a word I said since the first time I said 98. It's 99. You're leaving someone out of the equation. Get it right. Um, now, I know we're counting sheep, but stay awake with me as we, as we get through this. Um, and actually, I think it could be the, 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 the 125 because of inflation. I went to the dollar store the other day. It's now the dollar 25 store. I had no idea. When did that happen? But here's why I ke keep saying the 98. Of course, the other sheep are an important part of this parable. It was, in fact, their question that prompted Jesus to tell this story in the first place. The hope is that by some miracle of God's spirit and God's word combined, that even one of the 99 would no longer simply keep grazing on the hill, that perhaps one of the Pharisees and the, or the scribes literally got up from the table, moved around to the other side, and a new friendship was formed. 
I hope, I have the same prayer. I hope for, it's me. But if it's not me, I hope it's one of you. We were at Starbucks the other day. Uh, you can find Wendy and I there far too often. Um, and she came out to the table where I was sitting and she said, would it be all right if we, if we bought a, a drink for the, this homeless man that, that just came inside? Apparently he had come inside to get out of the heat. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I hadn't even noticed him. He was one of the only ones in there and I hadn't even noticed. Um, she went in to pay for this drink uh, and the baristas uh, shook her off and, and they said, don't worry about it, we'll cover it. And so the 99 at that moment became the 98 and then the 98 became the 97. If we're the body of Christ, a body that by definition suffers whenever another human being suffers the way Christ suffered for us, then what will it take for us to join Jesus in his mission to bring the good news to the poor, to release captives, to restore sight, to suffer with those who have been oppressed until they know freedom and then we can know freedom with them. And when that happens, joy happens. Joy is possible. And it must be shared. I'm really encouraged by someone in our own church that has taken time to look at the housing crisis here in Sacramento. A traumatic situation that's only going to get worse. The 99 became the 98 when she dove deep into research, into community meetings, to advocate for better communication, and came away with a heart for those, especially in the, the Meadowview to Florin area uh, that will be feeling the greatest pain in this over the next, uh, these next couple of years. A place that no one else seems to be paying attention as the politics of this seem to be, uh, be uh, complex. Our church will be having conversations over the next couple of months, I hope, in simply how to partner or to, to, to look at being with churches in that area um, to be able to go over the freeway and, and, and simply join them in the, the plight that they, will, um, that they will be struggling with. I'm hopeful that that will happen. What if the 99 referred also to whole churches that started to find identity in the way that we, we find people in the, in the shadows? Um, I think that characteristic is, is built into our DNA already from what I've seen. Um, but it's good to take a look at the parable again and and realize how God may be calling us. On a personal note, I am so grateful for a church family that has given me such incredible support for a sabbatical journey that I'm about to take in just a little less than two weeks. And as it approaches, I am sensing more and more uh, the importance from time to time to take a step away from the usual, away from the 99 to spend time with the one. I get to have one-on-one time, a week at a time, with each one of my daughters, and also with my wife, um, in a way that ordinary life of ministry uh, makes very difficult. In the end, I hope it brings joy and celebration, even though I know that it won't be without its challenges. So I would love your prayers. We would love your prayers in that. The other day, I was out on a run and it was 97 degrees, brilliant short choice of time to run. And as I longed for shade in much more than, than usual, I, was, I found myself running in and out of the shadows. Um, and it gave me a, an idea to write a song with, with the title, In and Out of Shadows. Um, and maybe I'll have some time over the next few months to, to give that a try. Regardless, it's, it's the story of my life, really. One moment I'm hiding in the shadows, even hiding from God, and the next moment God finds me and brings me out in, into light that I, uh, that's unexpected and joyful. Um, this rhythm I think most of us can relate to, to be able to take some, some time away to recover gratitude and joy and to remember that I too am the lost sheep. This could be possibly the greatest gift of these next few months. Only then could I offer this gift to my own family and with hopefully grace and joy and a little bit of laughter and adventure 
remind them that God gives, uh, that, that God goes with them as well in and out of shadows of our lives. That God is good all the time and that all the time, God is good. I want to end with these thoughts from Ezekiel of all places. The Old Testament. We may think Jesus is changing here the, the character of God. But I think it makes it clear here that the character of God is consistent. That God is good even through the Old Testament. Um, a whole two-thirds of our Bible that many of us look to and think, oh, that, that was a time when God was vindictive, full of wrath and judgmental. Um, but what Jesus is portraying here about the kingdom of heaven has always been there. Even about this specific parable of the shepherd. And so hear these words in Ezekiel as I read through them about what a good shepherd looks like. And Jesus would have known this. It says, For thus says the Lord God, I, find my, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will sort them out. As shepherds sort out their flocks when they are among scattered sheep, so I will sort out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and with mountain heights of Israel, and of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring them back to bring back the strays and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. And sorry, but this last verse is a part of this too, so I have to read it. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. When we've come to a place of self-reliance, we tend to forget the good news of the gospel. Jesus' parables Break us out of that once again. And so I hope you find that in this season. My prayer as we head into this series on parables is that, that God will speak to us individually as well as, as, as a church and, and cause us to look across the table again. And rather than grumbling about who is this that's included in this good news, what are you saying? That we will learn to kneel inside our canoe in prayer together relying more fully on God's grace as we offer it to others. Amen. There's a song I, I came across late this week that I almost played for you. Not sure about the copyright rules, but I'll, I'll leave it for you to, to listen to on your own if you need further ins inspiration. Maybe it's just something I needed as I was working through this message, but it was called I Will Carry You by Ellie Holcomb. And I heard it on the radio again and was reminded that I need just once again that Jesus is also seeking me out. So it's there to listen to later if you wish. I want to take just a moment of silence and then, uh, then we'll pray together. But before we, before we do that, um, it, it, let this just be truly the prayers of the people. I want to give just about 10 seconds for you to lean towards someone and just say something you would love there to be prayer for. Um, for, your work, for the world, for something in your life, um, whatever it might be, just, just lean in where you are, give you about 10 seconds to, to whisper something to someone about what you would love to pray us for, pray us for today. Let's pray together. Lord God, the, the canoe that you've given to us seems about ready to capsize. We don't pretend to know why, and in the midst of the prayers that we offer, help us to find a peace that only you can give, a peace that walks side by side of the chaos that we're experiencing. Help us to trust you, even as we fail to be able to come up with answers. We lift up to you this morning survivors in the tragedy in Afghanistan, their ground literally shaking and torn apart, taking the lives of thousands. Give us a sense of their suffering and help us to join them in sorrow at that loss. 
rather than trying to make sense of it. Forgive us whenever we have hinted that someone's tragedy has been deserved in any way. Free us to offer your kingdom of heaven to a world in need. Once again, God, our own country continues to head down a path of shaky ground that will leave us in turmoil, most likely. Individuals that are affected, we lift them up to you. Can we turn to you, Lord? Will you give us guidance every day about how to respond and to communicate in love with one another, even when we do not agree? Again, help us to see the suffering of individuals, to listen to your spirit, to simply pray and talk to you when we are prompted, to take time every day to feel your loving embrace on our lives. And God, we lift up to you silently now the prayers of those that were just mentioned around us this morning. Thank you, God, for hearing us, for restoring our sight, for freeing our places of captivity to our own selfishness. You are good, and we are grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our worship, we come to our time of offering. Once upon a time, we were the one who was lost. And God dropped everything to come and find us and bring us home. As we reflect today on God's loving kindness toward us, let us respond by offering back to God a generous measure of all his gifts to us. Let us give of our finances, our time, our talents, and so forth, the whole of who we are, offered in service to God, who continues to drop everything to seek all who are lost. After worship is over, you may place your offering in the basket at the back of the sanctuary. You may also give online or by mail. Let's take a moment now to consider how we will worship God through our giving. The last Sunday of the month, we want to lift up to, to, to us all the, the, the importance to think of offering as not just our financial resources, but our ways to give of, of time and energy as well. In your bulletin, you'll see a section called, if I can find it, Bless, uh, or uh, Time and Talents. Uh, and then there's a couple opportunities to, to, to help and to serve with us which you will find someone in the Welcome Center afterwards. That you can put your name on a list just for information, not to necessarily sign up, um, but in some cases that too. Uh, today we have uh, fireworks booth volunteers. In, we're in need of that, although we're doing pretty well. We could, we could use some, some help on a few of those spaces. Um, so so uh, find your way to, to the table about that. And also members to be part of the fellowship team. You can contact Kitty Tatro. This is a, a team that's sort of coming out of the, the woodwork and has been a little bit dormant because uh, fellowship opportunities have not been as possible the last few years. Um, so they're gathering a team together to be able to put together events of, for fellowship in, in our church. I know they're excited about some of those in this time coming up. So those are a couple of ways that you can be mindful. Maybe God is tapping you on the shoulder to respond. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to invite uh, Margie Montzingo to come and to share a bit from her life. We also like to, to take this time of offering to, to hear from someone in our midst about the way God is, is working or has worked in their lives. Thanks, Margie. Had to get my prop ready. Good morning. My name is Margie Manzingo. My husband, Dennis, and I have been attending Faith since January of 2021. 
we came to this church after my husband Dennis retired as minister of Clarksburg Community Church after serving there for 32 years. <clears throat> Please allow me to create, if you will, a visual picture of my life and how God has worked in my life outside the walls of the church. I will be using the visual picture of a tapestry. The vertical threads of my tapestry, known as the warp threads, are my faith and my family. The horizontal threads, known as the woof threads, are the experiences of my life that are creating the beautiful fabric that the Lord is not yet finished creating. First, the vertical threads. I was raised in the Catholic Church and regularly attended church with my family from birth through my college years. It was upon meeting Dennis in the spring of 1977 that I began to wonder more about my faith and was introduced to attending churches other than the Catholic Church that I was so familiar with. It was in 1978 when I lived for six months in the San Francisco Bay Area that I began attending a Protestant church there and attending Bible studies as well. Two very important threads to begin my tapestry with. The next vertical threads are the threads of family. I'm the youngest of five girls, raised by a stay-at-home mother and a father that was a career Marine. Seven more threads. I grew up mainly in upstate New York, attending college there and graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in computer programming. It was while working in Hartford, Connecticut as a computer programmer that I met Dennis where he was teaching high school English at a private Christian school there. Dennis and I were friends for several years before marrying in 1979. Another thread added. In January of 1980, Dennis began seminary on the North Shore of Boston and I worked as a computer programmer for Parker Brother Games there. Our first daughter, Emily, was born while Dennis was still one year from finishing his Master of Divinity degree. Yet another thread. <clears throat> we prayerfully made the decision for me to stay home full time and Dennis continued on with his studies. He received his calling to his first church in Putnam, Connecticut and was ordained into full-time ministry. He served there for five years and our next two daughters, Anna and Carolyn, were born during this time. Two more threads. We felt the Lord calling us to the West Coast and the chance to be closer to Dennis's five brothers and his mom and dad. Once we arrived in Clarksburg, I enjoyed staying home with our three daughters, ages two, four, and six, and was a parent volunteer in Clarksburg Elementary School. Being home full time allowed me the opportunities to reach out to other moms and their families that were also home. Many deep and lasting friendships were formed during this time. It was during this time that our son Tim was born. Our warp threads were now set. Now to the woof threads, those life experiences that would fill my tapestry. I continued volunteering at the elementary school until our son began kindergarten. What began as a volunteer position ultimately turned into a 21-year paid profession, as I was a special programs coordinator for two elementary schools in the Delta. This became my calling as I found many opportunities to be a positive influence and encouragement to staff, students, and parents at these two schools. I worked with educationally challenged students as well as English learners and found numerous opportunities to minister to and pray for all the families I came to know over the years. This truly was a mission field for me, and I loved it. Add more threads for all of the special families that became a part of my life and the rich experiences that I had with my students. While our children were young, we had the usual activities, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, church children's choirs, campfire girls, Boy Scouts, soccer, baseball. Once our children were in high school, the commitments changed and everyone seemed even busier. Our home was filled with children, 
our own children, and their friends, and we found great joy in having the chance to share our faith with many of our children's friends. What fun times those were with a very full house that had nonstop activities. We loved it and were challenged by it. The threads here became varied and colorful with the rich activities of our family. Over the years, I found a variety of ways to be involved in our church in Clarksburg, including overseeing Vacation Bible School, leading women's summer Bible studies, facilitating a weekly women's Sunday school class, participating on the worship committee, the hospitality committee, the missions committee. All of these experiences encouraged my love of ministering to others in our church, the schools, and ultimately found Dennis and myself ministering for two weeks to orphaned and abandoned children in Romania with the mission organization Heart to Heart International. My tapestry continued to grow and became rich in color and experiences. Over the years, our life has not been without challenges. Dennis's back surgery while I was pregnant with our son, Tim, breast cancer followed by radiation, the death of our parents, the death of a grandson at five and a half months due to a heart condition, the death of my sister from ALS and breast cancer once again. In the midst of all these situations, God was there sustaining us. These were such amazing opportunities to allow our church and our family, those warp threads, to minister to us and to carry us through the difficult times. And these woof threads added, they were oh so strong. Since retiring a year ago, I have been using my faith in a personal prayer ministry for our 14 grandchildren, our children, and their spouses. This, along with our involvement here at Faith and traveling to spend time with those children and grandchildren, have kept Dennis and myself busy and blessed. More woof threads still. The Lord has indeed blessed the many ways he has allowed me to serve over the years. Thank you for this opportunity to share a bit about myself, and I look forward to meeting you and adding you to my tapestry, created by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the ways that you weave together the threads of our lives. Take what little that we can offer to you in gratitude um, and sustain uh, us and sustain others in your, in your great kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my words. As we go, uh, pray that prayer that, that God would lead us and that we would find God's people wherever, wherever we find them and that we'd be able to share that good news. Um, a reminder again that uh, up front there will be someone here to pray with you if you have a, a request, something that you would like prayers for. Um, come, come join us uh, for that. And as you go, find someone you don't know and, and, and greet them. Introduce them to someone that you do. Uh, as we continue in our time together. As Maggie leads us out with the light of Christ, go with these words. May the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit, and the peace of Christ be with you. Go out and, and anticipate miracles and know that with God all things really are possible. Amen. <laughs>